So we can create productivity baselines based on this, but I want to uh, change the notion of a baseline from a fixed number to the concept that this can be a monotonic, monotonically decreasing function uh, unless we take action to do something about it. Next, next uh, click, please. So we've got these two measures, release productivity and quality adjusted productivity. And so the quality adjusted productivity, constantly tracking that uh, and trying to make sure that we sustain the quality of the product that's going to allow us to keep this, this productivity baseline from being a declining function and hopefully keep it reasonably stable. And if we're really doing a great job, continually improving the productivity over time. But we have to control quality if we're really going to truthfully improve productivity across all the releases uh, in, an, in the lifetime of an application. Next slide, please. So I want to now shift into productivity analysis. And this is some work I'd done at a previous company I was in. We created a very large corporate-wide uh, productivity analysis and measurement system. And we found that we had to segment the different kinds of work being done in the company. This was a large conglomerate that owned different kinds of companies. And we realized over time that we really couldn't compare apples and oranges, that we had to segment productivity into several different buckets to really get baselines that were meaningful and that we could track over time. Uh, for instance, we had a number of companies that were engaged in, in various kinds of engineering. We had aerospace companies, we had telecommunication companies, we had uh, companies that produce technical products, uh, and and you know they worked in languages like C and various C derivatives. So we could reasonably compare those kinds of programs. But we also had uh, the programs that ran the businesses, uh, uh, you know, uh, customer resource management programs, uh, financial programs, other kinds of business programs that sat inside the IT shop. We really couldn't compare their productivity with engineering. It was a different kind of work, it was different sets of languages, different technologies, different platforms. So we really had to create different baselines. We found those to be much more productive than the, than the engineering programs because frankly in some cases uh, they didn't have the real-time component, they were less complex and, and, and in some cases less challenging from an engineering point of view. We also had programs that in, in some cases were less than 20,000 lines of code. Uh, it did all kinds of small things, small functions, and those were much more productive because we weren't trying to uh, work with large, complex systems and make changes into large, complex bodies of software. So we really had to, at least at a minimum, segment our productivity analyses into these three buckets to make any sense of it. Uh, however, the CEO was demanding that we give him an annual baseline for productivity across the company. So even though productivity analysis was conducted in these three buckets and we were learning what would control productivity in these different, uh, different environments so we could help them with their improvement programs, uh, next slide please. The CEO wanted annual baselines. So this was back in the company I was in in 1980 and 81. Uh, we produced a baseline in, in uh, 1980. Back then, we were basically having to deal with lines of code, but at least we came up with a consistent way of, of counting them across the entire corporation. Uh, so at least even with some of the flaws, we were able to, to get some comparability. So we had a baseline in 1980. It was around, uh, around 18 to 1900 lines of code. And our 1981 baseline was around 20, somewhere between 23 and 2400 lines of code, and show we showed a nice improvement. Now there's all kinds of, of games we had to play and how things got laid into 1980 versus 1981. For instance, if it was on if it completed on December 31st, did it go into to which bucket did that go into? What happens if it was on January 1? Which bucket did it go into? Even though they were both done at the same time, it's just one day difference in, in how they were what their release was uh, uh, was accounted on. So we had all kinds of issues like that, but we made sense out of it. We showed a 20 some odd percent improvement in productivity. Uh, the vice president that was in charge of software across the entire corporation got great kudos. Everything was wonderful. Uh, the CEO was extremely happy for us. Our, our baseline, our, our funding was increased for the following year. However, in the report when I produced it, I warned that uh, I saw that in 1982 we were going to have lots of very large engineering programs reported, and as you saw in the previous slide, those baselines were lower. Uh, 
And so I warned that productivity could decline in 1982 purely based on the sample, based on the programs that we're reporting and the different baselines we fall for different types of programs. Well, I was told immediately to get that paragraph out of the 1981 report, you know, because we, we had this 24% increase. We don't want to take anything away from this improvement we've made. We'll deal with the 82 problem when it arrives. Well, lo and behold, next click, please. In 1982, we had a 10% decline. Why? Because most of the programs that were reported that year came out of the engineering organizations, and they had a lower baseline just for the nature of the application. Uh, needless to say, the CEO wondered what was going on, and I tried to explain sampling theory, and I tried to explain random variation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He wasn't hearing any of it. So the notion of segmenting applications, and this is one of the best practices in productivity analysis, is absolutely critical. If we're going to make sense of baselines, if we're going to be able to compare things, if we're going to be able to see what kinds of factors are improving productivity over time. Next slide, please. So we need to look at demographic factors and then decide which ones are most important for segmenting applications for the purpose of productivity analysis. Uh, the type of application can be critical. Uh, the languages are written in the frameworks that are being used, the technology platform, the age of the application. I mean, if, you've got, if you're working on legacy COBOL systems that over 30 years have been, have been modified and fine-tuned to the nth degree because they're in high-throughput transaction environments, uh, you fine-tune them for performance, you, you get knocked all the security holes out of them, but they are, in some cases, monstrosities to try to maintain because they're not documented. Uh, extremely large components that we see on average about 600 lines of code, extremely complex, and so changes are very slow. However, in modern systems, which are much more modular, where the modules are averaging 30 to 50 lines of code, uh, it ends up those are much easier to change because it's easier to figure out uh, kind of what's going on with the code. Uh, so we, we see very different baselines for different types of app applications and language platforms, uh, and therefore those probably shouldn't be compared on the same baseline. And so taking some of these uh, types of issues into account is fairly critical. If you're in an environment where you have a number of different organizations you're comparing, it, they're at different levels of maturity. If you're doing a CMMI-based improvement program, you'll find that those create very different baselines between level two, level three, and, and uh, levels four and five. Very different baselines for productivity. It wouldn't be good to try to compare them because they really are in different kinds of environments. Uh, so these are, these are issues that need to be taken into account when you're doing productivity analysis. And therefore, you need to know some of the demographic characteristics of the various applications that you're trying to incorporate into an analysis uh, regime uh, before you go kind of create baselines. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk now about a process. And I'll put some of these best practices into this sort of 11-stage process for uh, productivity analysis. I'm not going to talk about every process involved, but there's at least 11 here that we've learned some lessons on that are fairly important. And I'll go through these in order and give you a little bit of, uh, of input on each one. Uh, first slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, the first one is initiating an improvement program, initiating a productivity measurement and uh, analysis program. And you've got to start with executive support. I mean, we know this from any kind of improvement program that if you don't have executive support, people aren't going to pay attention. In fact, uh, about 70% of all improvement programs fail. And the reason they fail, the number one reason they fail is lack of executive support. Uh, people will put their focus where executives are focusing. And if executives don't back the program, then people aren't going to pay a lot of attention to it because they know it won't be enforced over time. Uh, so the executives have to state what the critical business reason is for doing it. Uh, they need to track progress, and everybody needs to know they're tracking progress. Uh, they need to enforce compliance with the program, make sure everybody's participating, providing data, and using the data for improvement. And the goal is, that in the long run, executives need to use what's coming out of the analysis program for insight into what's controlling their, their costs, their, their business risk, and a number of other things. Uh, next click, please. Uh, you need to charter a measurement group, or at least some set of people that are, are experts in measurement theory and statistics in software measurement. Uh, at least one full-time member needs to be in this group. You need to have someone that does know measurement and statistics 
uh, because you're going to run into these problems. Uh, they need to, if there is an improvement function, a process improvement group or, or Six Sigma group, uh, a lean group, then this needs to be linked into that function because this is the data that will be needed to make improvements uh, in process uh, using lean techniques or Six Sigma techniques or any of the other popular improvement paradigms. Uh, these people also need to have good communication skills because they're going to have to work with most of the application teams in order to get measurements installed, used, understand how to use them effectively, uh, take into consideration any strange things about the application that need to be uh, considered when you're building the measurement program. Uh, next click, please. It's critically important to automate as much of the data collection as possible. It seems pretty obvious, but we've seen measurement programs wither over time because the effort to collect the data was just too great, people got under too much pressure for other things, and data collection suffered. So automated data collection, the nice thing is now there's an awful lot of tools in the marketplace uh, for doing this. Tools for collecting quality data, tools for collecting productivity data, uh, and project management systems, and what have you. So pulling those together, using automated data collection, uh, but still, people that are, are working with that need to be trained. If they're supposed to get data into some system, they need to be trained in how to do that. For instance, if they're enter entering effort data into uh, some project management system, then they need to understand how it works and, and what have you so that they don't make a, a mess of it. Uh, if there's parts of the data that are going to only be partially automated, then again, the measurement team needs to assist the projects in getting that data so that it's accurate. Uh, next click, please. Now, it's important to seek consensus with the, the folks that are actually going to have to collect the measures, the, the applications, and then use them. Uh, if they feel like this is being forced on them, they're going to resist. We know that from just a lot of experience almost all of us have had. Uh, so we need to, number one, match the measures to the executives, to the objectives that the executives have, as well as the objectives objectives that the applications have, and it's the first real need for measure is support the application managers and developers uh, for what they're trying to accomplish. They want to use these measures for estimating future work. They want to make it for, use these measures for tracking current work, for assessing the quality of the current work, uh, so they can, they can figure out how to go about improving. So it's important that they look on these measures and that you work in developing these measures with the folks that are going to use them initially. Uh, to achieve their own objectives in, in building better applications and doing better jobs of estimating and managing their work. Uh, probably it's best to start with industry standards. You may have to modify those in some way for use with your own particular environment, but it's easiest to start there because then you know you've got reasonable comparability. And as you, as you get these measurement definitions, then it's best to go review them with the staff, with the developers, with management to make sure they, uh, they understand how to use these and they can raise the objections. But, but as long as there's some level of consensus, uh, you won't get the resistance you will if you just force measurements on top of the organization. Next slide. Now, this is critical. And, and, and the amount of data that's going to be inaccurate, even when you think you've automated data collection, is going to be staggering. Uh, when I built the productivity system that I reported to you about earlier, we challenged one sixth, or more, pardon me, one third of all the data we received. Uh, we we just did checks to say, hey, if it's this big, then you you can't have used that little effort to build it. It just doesn't make sense, uh, you know. And we go back and say, look, based on kind of what you've shown us, these don't seem to be consistent. Can, can you go back and check your numbers? And of the 30% of the productivity data we were given that we challenged, one half was found to be wrong. That's one-sixth of all the data we received was inaccurate. In some cases, by an order of magnitude, uh, they had the decimal point in the wrong place. Uh, so it's critical that you, you continually validate the data you're getting, even if it's coming with an automated system. Somebody may be putting the data in wrong, and the automated system may have some kind of an error process that just says, okay, we'll just put zeros in that, in that, uh, in that cell when we get data we don't understand. Uh, so you need to identify where those are, go back and find out what's wrong, and get the data corrected. Uh, so there's all these correction issues that need to be taken into account, but data validation never really stops. Every, uh, every new da set of data needs to be validated so you make sure you, there aren't defects in the data of some type. Uh, next click. Uh, it's critical in force data management. I mean, first, you need to, especially with a measure like function points, you need to 
to clarify what the boundaries of the application are, what's, going, what's considered a part of the application, what's not part of the application. Uh, what's part of the, therefore, what effort is going to be considered within bounds, what effort is going to be considered outside of bounds. Uh, so those are fairly important up front uh, to make sure you've got the right body of code that's being accounted for when you're doing productivity analysis. Uh, second, you need to get these measures under change and version control. Over time, you're going to upgrade tools. New tools will count new things. Uh, for instance, if you have a static analysis tool uh, doing structural quality analysis, uh, people will add new kinds of structural flaws into the kinds of flaws that are being searched for. And therefore, different versions of the tool will, won't be comparable because you've added new kinds of flaws into what's being discovered. And so you need to go back and normalize against changes in the way you're counting things and the improvements in the tools that are being made so you always know what's the standardized baseline that we want to compare against over time. Uh, which particular baseline or which particular set of tool versions uh, were these data calculated against? Because that's the only way I'll ever be able to compare apples and oranges, is to know and to be able to normalize against the versions of the tools, uh, the versions of the data definitions that I've created. This actually ends up being a more complex problem than most people realize when they get into productivity analysis. Uh, but it's fairly important to get this kind of change in version control uh, into existence very early. So over time, as you continue to improve the way you're collecting productivity data, uh, you're, you're able to manage the comparability back to previous versions. As you get baselines, you're going to want to know which set of tools created that baseline. So again, you can compare over time. Next, next click, please. Okay, for analyzing data, the first thing, you know, Statisticians, good statisticians, good data analysis and the analysts don't start with statistical packages. Uh, they don't go throw t-tests and f-tests and chi-squares and all kinds of statistical analyses at the data until they've looked at the distributions. The first thing they look at is the distribution because that'll tell you something about the legitimacy of the different kinds of statistical analyses you can perform. Uh, they want to understand what the shape of the distribution is. They want to understand that there's some restriction on the range of that distribution that would affect you know, correlations or other kinds of, of outcomes. They want to look for outliers and extreme values and go back and see why are those, you know, why is that an outlier? What, is there something radically different about that? And we ought to segment that out uh, and not include that in the baseline. Or are these things that we ought to include in the baseline? Um, you know, if I have outliers, the means not, may not be meaningful. I may want to go to the median. I might even want to look at the mode. So there's these kinds of considerations that need to be discovered by looking at the distribution and trying to understand what's going on in the data. Uh, and then revalidate anything that looks weird or strange. Uh, and understand early on if I've got restrictions of range, if I've got outliers, how is that going to, that going to affect my interpretation? Next click, please. Okay, then segment application, we talked about that before. Use the demographic data to decide what are the major segments of applications for which we'll form baselines. Because I don't want to be comparing apples and oranges. I'd rather have a baseline that compares apples to apples uh, so that over time I don't have some kind of a bizarre sampling thing affecting my, my productivity baselines. I'm really, I've really got a good sample of like projects that we can compare and understand. Now within that collection of projects I might discover there's a very different set of factors controlling productivity in one segment than in another segment. That's very important because that helps drive the productivity improvement program. And we can only detect that if we really look inside the different segments at their baselines and what's causing and driving productivity within each of those segments. Uh, next click, please. And iterate the analyses. I mean, every, every time I've done a productivity analysis, the first thing I look at is the scatter plot of data. You know, what's, what's going on here? What's, what's happening with these data? Uh, and why? And, and so continue to ask why questions and let that drive you to additional analyses. Uh, because you're going to continue to say, why is this data point out here? Why, is, why did this figure come out the way it did? Why do these numbers not correlate with numbers over here that should correlate with? So you're constantly iterating the analysis to get better explanations of what's controlling productivity and quality within your particular segment or across the organization. Next click, please. I 
I find it's best to pre-brief the results with the application managers. Go back to the particular application with the data for their uh, for their results for the for the particular release that you're reporting against, and discuss it with them. Show them how it compares to the overall averages within their segment. Uh, talk to them about things that control it. If there's out if they're an outlier, talk about why. Seek clarifications and explanations. Uh, you might find there were some mistakes or misinterpretations that you need to be aware of. Uh, you might even need to be correct, correcting some of the data if they suddenly realize something was screwed up that wasn't caught when you validated uh, the data. Uh, it may just be that they've got problems, and those problems are going to come out when this gets reported up to execs. And you want to prepare them so they're they're prepared to deal with what they're going to have to deal with when their their data get reported as a part of the overall uh, productivity baseline and analysis report. Uh, next click, please. So finally, there's reporting this typically to some set of executives. Could be the application development uh, VP. Could be higher than that. Uh, but the fact is, you need to know in advance, what do executives want for the data so that I can organize the way we present the data to meet their objectives, not just kind of throwing out a bunch of numbers saying, here it is, uh, and try to anticipate in advance the questions they're going to ask so you've got the explanations. Uh, and to the extent you've learned some things in the data, you may want to highlight some critically important messages so they get insight. Uh, but the bottom line is you, you want the executives to walk away with, with the information they need to make decisions. It's ready in their hands. And you're not leaving them in a situation where they're likely to misinterpret what you told them. And that's, that's a critical part of trying to figure out what questions are going to be in their mind as they look through the data and how they're going to use that data in the future and what questions they might have about it. Uh, so these are some of the best practices we've seen in productivity analysis, starting with the, the creation of the program all the way through reporting the baselines. Next slide, please. So I want to leave you then with uh, an invitation to join CISC. Uh, we'll have a lot of this material on the website. These slides, I believe now, or will shortly be uh, on the website. You can download a PDF if you're a member. It'll be in the member section. Membership is free. Uh, we're trying to build a community of people concerned with the quality of software and how that quality affects business risk and cost and productivity and a number of other issues. We're in particular focused on structural quality, reliability, security, performance efficiency, maintainability, you know, all the other abilities that really in the long run control the cost and risk uh, that the organization experiences. We've got a blog on the site, and the, I have a director's blog, but we also have a blog that people can contribute to. And we, we'd certainly like to have, you've got some important things to say, we'd love to have you contribute to the blog and interact with others uh, in, in the website. Uh, use this standard. We have the standards on, in the members area of the website for uh, the function point standard for automated function points, as well as the standard that describes the, uh, the various violations that are incorporated into the quality characteristic measures for reliability, performance efficiency, security, and maintainability. Uh, and even if you can automate those, you can at least look at the kinds of violations that are included in each one to get a sense of what you ought to be looking for when you're trying to evaluate the quality, the structural quality of your code. We're going to hold CISC webinar, pardon me, seminars at OMG meetings this year in Berlin, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and in Santa Clara out in the San Francisco area. Uh, at the OMG meetings, you've got the dates there. If you're in those areas, we invite you to come. They're all day seminars where we'll go through productivity management in much more detail than I have here in productivity analysis, as well as spending the afternoon on uh, software structural quality, uh, where we'll dig into the ways to measure it, the ways to improve it. Uh, at least in the U.S. and possibly in Berlin, we'll have a whole section on uh, software security, how to measure it, and how to, to, to deal with the security issues. Uh, we, encourage, we encourage you to initiate measurement, if you haven't already, uh, to continually improve not only the measurements you're taking, but also the, the way you're building software based on the measurements, uh, so that in the long run you can build great software. That's the objective of this entire activity, is to build great software so that we can help automate great companies. So with that, let me turn it back over to Becky, and we'll host a set of questions and answers until the top of the hour. Excellent. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, really quickly, before we launch into questions, I want to remind everyone that today we have a software productivity tweet up. It's going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern, and the hashtag is uh, hashtag IT underscore CISC. IT underscore, underscore CISC is also our Twitter handle. So 
Um, I urge you to check that out at 2 p.m. If you have more questions uh, from today, you can certainly ask them there. Um, let's get right into it because we're running out of time. Um, from Ian Brown, we have, aren't function points, aren't function points really a requirements-based size measure? Uh, in a sense, yes. Uh, we can include, decided to pull them out because they're, they're, there's a little bit more definition to them uh, than to some of the others. But yeah, in a sense, they are. You could include them in the best if you want. Um, all right. Someone is asking, uh, why do you say software productivity steadily declines for an application? As the application degrades over time, you modification effects and harder to work with for over time. Like it's more to worry about when you're trying to make uh, the result you'll spend just trying to with uh, you know new piece of software activity time is with mediate the problem. Okay, we're having trouble with audio, but let's just yeah. push forward here. So it will decline unless action is taken to improve it. And therefore, it will be harder to work with, and therefore, you'll be less productive. Uh, is this method for all kinds of software, including telecom embedded software, or is it only for, the IT, only for IT domain software? Uh, points are primarily used in IT. If I'm dealing with embedded software, especially real-time software, typically people in that world don't use function points. Uh, there's been some attempts to define function points for those kinds of applications, but people dealing with that fairly complex real-time uh, issue typically are using lines of code. But it's critical that they come up with a standard definition so at least they can to apples and have a way to evaluate the quality so that I don't just build large, badly structured software and get uh, you know, credit for productivity that's not really there. Um, but yeah, typically in the embedded world uh, and in the engineering world, people are not so much using function points as they are using things like lines of code. Okay. What is the best way to choose the granularity at which to report pr productivity data? And if I, want to avoid turning, if I want to avoid turning it into an individual or small team performance measure? I report. I report at the application level, uh, and you know it, it may be a small team maintaining the application, but that's that's. Uh, I, yeah, the trouble is if you start throwing a lot of things together. I've got a lot of small apps, and I, very different of apps and less brand new. Comparing and that's. We just kind of take everything that happened within a quarter and put it in one baseline. And as a result, depending on what got recorded, I've seen why. Uh, now, critical issue, and I, I, I should have mentioned the presentation. And the analysis and measurement is to use productivity data as part of an HR performance appraisal. Any, any kind of personnel-related, HR-related activity, keep your productivity data away from that. You'll destroy the program. The minute people think this is going to show up on their performance appraisal, they'll start gaming the data, especially they can game the effort data. I mean, developers are smart. They'll figure it out. Uh, and over time, the, the whole measurement program will lose credibility. So do not, absolutely do not use this in personnel measurement. There's a lot, you know, most managers know who's, who's doing good work and who's struggling. Uh, and if you use this data, if the team uses this data for improvement, that's good. Uh, they're using it for their own improvement. They're trying to discover what controls productivity and quality in their particular work or in their kind of, of application. That's a, that's a beneficial use. But managers taking this and using this in performance appraisals is, is definitely going to destroy the program over time. All right. Well, since we're having a little bit of audio trouble and we're just about out of time, I would urge everyone to uh, log on to Twitter today, 2 p.m. Eastern, um, to answer more of these questions, uh, ask more questions, and to, uh, to learn more about uh, software productivity. So again, the hashtag will be IT underscore CISC, C-I-S-Q, and our Twitter handle is at IT underscore CISC, C 
CISQ, as well as the website, it-cisc.org. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bill Curtis, Director of CISC, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning.